gone. So it's very important that students copy down exactly what's on the board. Now you see, I would completely disagree with you. Prescriptive? Absolutely, completely disagree with you. And why is that? Well, if it's on the board, then they should translate it into their own wording and terminal. And I'm not talking about definitions here. And it's mm -hmm. we're not talking about taking down a definition. I'm talking about yeah, a general explanation that you've displayed up on the board. Firstly, they have cell phones, most of them. Yes, so I think they that can taking take a photo photos. of the board is, yes. um, has kind of made this um, tip a little bit redundant these days. Yes. And then secondly, if you're just writing down word for word what you're got on the, what you're seeing on the board you're using a completely different part of your brain you're using the copying down part mm. I don't know brain terminology and I'm pretty much making this up <laughs> on the spot out of personal experience but I know that if I'm looking at something and I need to write it down yeah. and still understand it I must write it down in my own words well different people d work in different ways and um, sometimes is that a nice way of telling me I must keep quiet no absolutely <laughs> not um, but I know that there are some students in my class that if they don't write down what's on the board word for word, then they feel that everything is out of order and it's chaotic and they want me to go back. Um, whereas some learners are very comfortable to make their own interpretations of the notes on the board and it's still correct. Now, don't you think that that's a personality we've encouraged to be like that? Encouraged anxiety and things like that. Oh, that's a very good point. I'm going to let the teachers who are watching think about that for a while. Yeah, let us know. What do you think? I mean, in principle, having all of your notes in your book is a good idea. Mm. The, what I disagree with is not that they should have all the notes. It's that they shouldn't have an exact copy. Every book should be have their, their learners spin on it. So Daniel's book should look like Daniel's book and Mpo's book should look like Mpo's book and it should True. feel like their True. property. Yeah. Well, I think the essence of this tip is that learners should be engaging all the time. It would be no help if a learner slept on their book and their book just looks like dried spit stains from when they sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, that's a completely different show. <laughs> okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about general issues with statistics and probability and some yes. of them we have spoken about already. We have. With the time allocation versus the marks. Mm -hmm. In, especially in comparison to Euclidean geometry. geometry. Actually, we were talking earlier about bivariate data that we could talk about in this show. That might be an interesting thing to do. Bivariate data, data is wonderful and there are so many amazing situations which have bivariate data which we can look at. But uh, the comparison of number of weeks spent on a subject versus the mark allocation in the end of year. Well, that would be wonderful. Yes, it would. It would be a good activity to do in class. Look at us being creative. I think you, in, with your next writing, you will have to be a bit bigger. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we could look at number of weeks spent mm -hmm. on a topic versus the mark allocation. If so you press escape, we can go to the CAPS document. And get a lovely data set. Yes, and it's all there arranged, well, there's the one we would have to do some playing with it. So we could look at algebra, or what does that say? Algebra, algebra and equations. equations for 25 marks. And However, we don't have the CAPS document to see how many weeks are spent on yeah, it. Yeah, scrolling through it is going to take too long. So however many weeks, but we could then tabulate all of that data and make a lovely scatter plot and have a look at uh, if there's any correlation to it at all. Yes, and a little earlier we were talking about incorporating revision into these sections. Indeed. This is an excellent way to incorporate revision because you can go into those sections in your book and say, this, I've got 20 pages on algebra, mm -hmm. blah, 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 algebra and uh, equations. Uh, and we spent this many weeks on it. It's worth this much mark. Let's make a deduction about how much time we should, should spend, spend revising Exactly, revising each uh, topic. Yes. And we had Lee here a few d weeks, weeks ago. ago. Mm -hmm. Might have been last week. Yes. And she said that it's really up to the teachers to teach learners how to revise. And it shouldn't, the responsibility shouldn't only fall on a life skills teacher. It should 
be but maths teachers and teachers. everyone yes. else. So this yes. is a perfect opportunity to yeah. talk about how to revise. Yeah. Not only should teachers teach learners content, but they should also teach them skills yes. on how to revise, on how to learn this content. And, and that's hopefully what we're helping the teachers watching. Okay, now I have taken us a little bit off topic. No problem at all. <laughs> and we do have a lot to talk about because we're talking about two completely different sections in one show. Yes. So let's go on to the five point teaching strategy for statistics. Statistics, yes. And it's busy loading and how would you introduce statistics to a class? Well this really depends um, Helen because in many cases teachers cut down on the time spent teaching statistics in earlier grades because it always seems to end up being the last topic, kids are a little bit unruly. So um, I would say that my very first uh, strategy would be to revise previous grades work, um, especially grade 10 and 11 work. And while well, grade, grade 11 work will be tested in the matric exam, so it's very good to to revise some of the and that's of course work. standard deviation standard deviation that's um, the main thing isn't yes, it yes. everything else is am i wrong um <laughs> if i am guess <laughs> what you're not. back in two weeks time <laughs> to talk about Our grade 11 statistics actually it's probability oh, but we, we can throw in we some statistics about that as well yes okay mm -hmm. so your first point says revise grade 11 concepts well yes would you provide them with a note or would you get them to copy a note from the board <laughs> Well, I think that um, hopefully if um, I was their grade 11 teacher as well, I would have made them make a mind map of the section when they were in grade 11. Um, so they could go back to that mind map um, and, and see what they had done and maybe refresh their minds about those topics. It's not often someone comes in and says something that I haven't heard before. And one of you've just said use a mind map in maths. That's oh, absolutely. Mind maps are wonderful. How would your mind map go for statistics? Well, it would um, start off being very messy and then over, <laughs> <laughs> over time it would get more organized. Um, yes. You know, I think that, you know, like I say, and I always say this, different people work in different ways. And I'm not going to discriminate against mind maps or lists, but some people love the messiness and the chaos of mind maps. And as soon as they remember a, a concept, they make a shoot off and write little notes in a, in a bubble and some students like lists so so when I say mind map I mean uh, I'm talking about a more generic form of of summary yes. that a learner has put together for for grade 11 so but I think a, a mind map can very easily work for for math maths yes even though some people don't think it, it can I think you've got a good point there, especially with a thing like statistics. You have your mind map and you have your branches and then all yeah. of the information yeah. listed over there. Mm -hmm. Then if there is a connection, like f for example, variance and standard deviation, it's yes. pretty much the same arm, isn't it? Sure, I mean, I would, I would put that as exactly the same thing. But yeah. different arms could be single variable data, bi bivariate data. And you could show the relationships analyzing. between them using right. yeah. this. Yeah, so I suppose it's more of a flow diagram than a, so than a mind map. Okay. Or, so, or some sort of diagram. So apparently there is a difference between a mind map and a flow diagram. <laughs> These are good things I'm learning today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so flow diagram versus mind map, mind map pretty versus much make something that works. Sure. And the learners should make it themselves. I think so. I think um, a teacher can spoon feed so much, but at, uh, at the level of grade 11, a matric learners should certainly be creating their own content, summarizing their own content from textbooks, from class notes, from what the teacher says. Yeah. So hopefully okay. your learners are getting better at, uh, at being independent learners. Yes. Mm. Well, hopefully if you've worked on them for three years, from grade 10 to grade 12, it has yeah. happened. Mm. Okay, point two says learn how to tell whether data is symmetrical or skewed and its interpretation. Well, this is going back to um, a grade 11 concept as well, but it's very important and um, data can be symmetrical or skewed. And for me, the important thing is its interpretation. What does 
it mean when data is symmetrical? And we can, um, this comes into grade 12, uh, symmetrical data is your typical bell curve. Yes. Whereas skewed data, it looks like a bell curve, but it looks like it's been pushed over or squashed a little bit. Yes. And it can also be um, represented by a box and whisker plot or, or now some I other find ways. with I'm glad you put its interpretation over there because mm -hmm. I find that people often teach uh, it's skewed to the left, skewed to the right, but no one actually knows, the teacher included, what, what actually that means. actually means. Yes, and so you need to be able to say, well, it's skewed in a certain direction because the median is larger than the mean. I think and you need to talk more into your microphone. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's skewed more to why would it be skewed uh, in terms of, and you've got to talk about it in relation to the data. The actual data that you have. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Okay. D three says learn the method for calculating linear regression or the least squares method. Now this, d this phrase freaks me out a little, <laughs> least squares method. Explain a little bit. Well, Helen, um, when we when we get a linear regression line, basically what we're trying to do is um, when we have our scatter plot of bivariate data, and say for example we have a couple of data points, what we want to do is we want to um, we want to get a line that is best representative of this data, especially if it c correlates nicely. So, for example, if we have a line that um, Looks line like of best, best fit, fit is a grade nine concept, isn't it? Yes, it is. But in grade nine, um, it's very simple. You, you just draw a line that looks like it represents the data very well. And Whereas then you've got a whole lot of different lines, don't you? Yes, you can. Uh, uh, we talk about linear regression in grade twelve, but in grade nine, line of best fit could be a straight line. It could be a curve. But we basically have just freehand drawing the line. Yeah, okay. Whereas when we get to grade twelve, we actually need to calculate this line because we. Um, we're mu much more interested in accuracy, the accuracy of uh, the okay. line of regression. So, um, as teachers will know, to calculate the line of regression um, requires a table, and um, we're looking at the distances yeah. between the points, and then we square it, and then we add them all together, and we. But what is the it. point of it? But, but the point of it is to find um, a line that will give us the least area of squares, and and that's why it's called the least squares method. Let's say we draw a square from each point and it touches the line. Essentially what we're doing with the least squares method is we want to minimize the area of these squares as they are s when we touch the line. And this ensures that it's um, a line, oopsie that's a bit skew, it's a it's line the most that is the most accurate. And so just for comparison I'm going to draw a line that is completely not the line of best fit, like that. And as we can see that our data points close to the line will look fine, but as soon as we get these data points that are far away from the line, our squares become larger and larger and larger and no longer is it a least squares, it's a actually a really large square. And these squares could all And of course they're all squares and not rectangles. Um, Yes, unfortunately, my drawing is just slightly uh, freehand at the moment. Yes. These are all meant to be squares. Um, but so the point of a least squares, the least squares method is to find the smallest area of squares between the data points and our line of regression. That's actually a really good introduction for it, and to introduce the need to find a line that's the same as everyone else. And mm -hmm. I suppose you could talk about how in grade nine you all drew your lines and some of them were over there and some of them were over there and some of them were over there mm -hmm. and we don't want a sun diagram anymore. You see the sun? Yes, with all its rays. Yes, mm -hmm. we want one line to rule them all. Yes, we do. Yes. And and this will, um, this will definitely help because then we are able to predict results much more accurately. Okay, then step four, learn to use your calculator to do this. It saves a lot of time. Well, um, uh, I, we'll need a whole hour to talk about it, so I can talk about it very briefly. But if you have a standard cal calculator, a standard scientific calculator with a stats mode in it, yes. you are able to work it out, work it out using your calculator, and it can I think save you a lot must go time. to the manufacturer's website and Google how to do it. 
and yes. get those steps mastered before you teach it to your learners. Sure. Both Casio and Sharp offer um, offer workshops on how to use your calculator to, um, especially in a st statistical mode. Yes. Mm. And the last step, understand that all statistics is always about drawing a conclusion after analyzing the data. Now, this almost feels like it should be a first step, it should be an everything step, it should be added on to every point yes. in your teaching. Yes. Um, statistics is wonderful because it allows us to draw conclusions, but we need to know how to analyze the data to draw these conclusions. So we should keep it in mind with every step that we go. Yes. Now, you have drawn up three pressure points, yes. and these are the points where things could possibly go wrong, where you're teaching, or th where the learners would possibly go wrong. Mm -hmm. Shall we take a Let's look? Let's have a look at them very quickly. Okay, I'm just pressing the down arrow, and it's taking its time. There, there we, we go. go. Okay, not knowing the terminology for the topic. So stats is very important because there are a whole lot of new concepts and with new concepts come new terminology. So what I wanted um, to point out especially is that learners should be able to engage with this terminology and use it. So for example, um, if a learner gets asked uh, for variance and then gets asked for standard deviation, they might freak out and say, oh, now I have to do the whole calculation all over again. But if they know and understand the terminology and understand the concept that uh, standard deviation is just the square root of variance, then it's very easy. That so does sound like the type important. of thing that they would have to copy down from the board word for word. Yes. Yes. Or at least keeping the concept intact. They should definitely have a list of terminology somewhere. Yes. Okay, number two, not using your calculator to your advantage. As we said earlier, both um, Cassio and Sharp uh, give workshops and have extensive uh, online resources on how to use your calculator, especially in statistic mode. And it really will help you from entering in each data point over and over again, especially yes. if you're working with a set of data. Um, if you use it on stats mode, you can enter in a set of data points once and it keeps it in its memory and you can work with that data um, in many different ways. Yeah. Okay, and the third point, difficulty with interpreting the results, and that goes back to skewed data and Correct. a whole lot of other mm. things as mm. well. Mm. Not only do we need to know the procedures to calculate um, uh, all, all of our, um, y you know, all of our calculations and statistics, we need to know how to interpret them. And if we can't interpret them, we'll, we will have done all these procedures for nothing because we don't know what what the data is telling us. So it's, it's, um, it's good to know if a, a, a data collection or a set of data points is skewed to the left, what does it mean, what is it telling us, and what conclusions can, can we draw? It's almost, the section almost loses its relevance if you're not constantly analyzing the data that you've got in front of you or drawing conclusions from it. Mm -hmm. Everyone can answer questions, everyone can do calculations, so you can teach everyone to do it. Mm -hmm. There may be a couple that don't do it 100%, but sure. to actually analyze what's coming out, that's a higher order skill. It is. Mm -hmm. And, and it needs to be practiced a lot in I order to I think it's something get that it. we really do need to encourage learners to grapple with, it, especially from earlier grades, so it becomes second nature yeah. by the time we get to grade 12. Okay, now you have brought an activity for us to look at in the Let's Get Practical section. Yes, I wanted us to look at a comparison. It's um, a set of bivariate data, which means we've got two variables, and it's looking at the brain weight of an animal, and we're comparing it to the entire animal's body weight. And, well, humans are also included, so I shouldn't say only animals. And what I want the teachers to um, tell us is, do you think that there will be a correlation? Um, so if you, are, if you have your Facebook or Twitter open or the chat box open, we'd love to hear from you. And it would be great if you could say something to us because don't forget that you have a chance of winning. 110 Rand, Rand Vodacom Airtime. Airtime. Yes. Awesome. Okay, so. Well, what do, do you, you think? think? Helen, do you think there'll be a correlation? Okay, I'm going to say yes because I think I'm heavier than everyone else in this room. So it You've obviously means brain. I've got a bigger <laughs> brain. Um, and yourself? Well, I think so, Helen, because I, I think if you look at a mouse, a mouse is very tiny and it'll obviously have a very small brain. 
Whereas if you look at an elephant, an elephant is very large and it'll have a very big brain. So I think the bigger the animal, the bigger the proportion of brain there is. Well, shall I not say proportion, shall I say the bigger the animal, the bigger the brain will be. So yes, I do think there is a correlation. Poor ostrich. Very, very <laughs> small brain. Unfortunately, we only have uh, mammals in our data sets. Yes. So we okay. can't talk about the ostrich. Uh, unfortunately, the text is quite small for the table that Karen has pulled up. Uh, but sh this will be available on the blog afterwards. So if you want Wonderful. to use it, you're welcome to use the data. And we have pulled it from another website, which will be cited in the blog as well. And so why don't you read out a couple to us quickly? Well, so over here we see that um, we've got animals and then their body weight and the body weight is in kilograms and the brain weight is in grams. So a mountain beaver will be uh, 1.35 kilograms and its brain is on average 8.1 grams. And so the list goes. Okay. So on our, our next slide, yes, we can see that we've now put all of this data into a scatter plot. However, there's a bit of a problem with this uh, scatter plot in that there's two animals that have extraordinarily large weights. And I'll tell you what it's they not are. It's me. It's the, uh, the <laughs> elephant, <laughs> the and African elephant, and the Asian elephant. Okay. Two animals in our data set which had, which had very large weights. And unfortunately, that is um, causing all the, our other data points to cluster in the bottom there. So what I did is I took away these two animals' weights um, on the next slide, which gives us a much clearer picture of the data. And it's now animal weight versus brain weight, and there are no elephants. Okay, I'm just going back to the previous slide, and we can see that it went up to a brain weight of 6,000 grams. grams. Uh, but in the next slide, it goes to a brain weight of 1,400 grams. Yes. And the body weight goes to 600 kilograms, whereas the previous slide... It was in its thousands. 7,000. 7, imagine that sitting on you. Mm. So imagine, if you will, that all those data points which were clustered at the bottom yes. have now had a very big magnifying glass put on them and now we can see them w with a much more appropriate scale. I think it's important when you do that kind of demonstration in a class to point out the change in th uh, the x and y axis. Otherwise, they think that everything's just kind of moved away. Yes. yes. So the data points have actually stayed the same. We've just kind of zoomed in on each axis. Maybe, don't point it out, maybe ask them why they've been distributed more. Sure, sure. Get them to think. Mm. Okay, yes, carry on. So on our next slide, um, if we can just move on, um, we have now uh, added in the regression line, which has yes. been um, calculated using the least squares method. And as we can see, um, it shows us that it's a positive regression line. I, I wouldn't say that the correlation is extremely strong, but you can see that it's been uh, correlated quite well. And um, we can also work out the correlation for coefficient um, to tell us how, how well co um, correlated the data set is. But if we notice over there, um, so our, our regression line is, uh, has got a positive trend, yes. which will tell us that... Um, and that's how you, that's where the least squares, squares would help be. Us. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this activity would be good to introduce the need for the least squares method. I think it would be a very good activity to start the, um, learn us off with learning about regression lines. But um, so, so it gives us a po uh, an overall positive trend which means that the, uh, the bigger your body weight is, the bigger your brain weight will be. Um, now surely if you want to teach the line of regression you need to introduce the need to do it. Yes, and, and so the need is to find to, to, uh, to, to find a line that will predict uh, what brain weights will be uh, for different animal ah, weights. So are you, you about see, we different? haven't even got to that. What is the point? What is the point? You see, we're such maths teachers, aren't we? We're just <laughs> like, you've got to do this calculation and then it's done and then you yeah, get you your marks. The next one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, the line of regression or the regression line is actually predicting a trend. So we could say that if there is an animal with a body weight of 300 kilograms, it should what roughly would we have expect their brain weight to yes. be. Yes. Correct. So yeah. it, obviously you would mention that at this mm -hmm. point. Um, now, Helen, I want to point something out to you, and, yes. and that is there's one mammal in this data set that doesn't quite fit 
the overall trend. Yes. Can you sp- can you spot it? <laughs> it's not like we've highlighted it at all. Or anything. Could it possibly be the human? Yes, he it is. could be. And Helen, I think that is why you and I are here today talking about things like maths and not uh, scratching in the dirt for um, food or something like that. Yes. So humans are very intelligent mammals compared to other intelligent mammals and a possible reason for this is we have as More you can to see work with. There we have an extraordinarily large brain in comparison to our body weight. Now we talk about revision, doing revision while we're mm-hmm. doing this. I suppose this would be a good point for this particular example to introduce ratios or go back and just revise because fractions is always, always an issue. Correct. And what would be very interesting is to take these uh, data, data points that we have in, and say what percentage of each um, mammal's body is a brain and obviously because um, we have a very high uh, or shall I say a very big brain in comparison to our body it'll be a much larger percent than for example a monkey or a dasi or any of the other uh, uh, animals that were on our data set. Yeah. So that's a fantastic idea. Incorporate um, many different areas of maths into one question. Yes. Now there is one caution Yes. I would say to maths teachers, Mm -hmm. remember that you're dealing with teenagers. So when you choose your data set to um, to accumulate or to 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 collect, collect, thank you, don't go for weight. Just avoid the students' weight like the plague. (laughs) Especially if you're in all girls' school. Yes, it's Mm. just shame. Yes. However, something that learners aren't as sensitive about is height or shoe size. Yes. Or um, hand length. Um, I've often seen um, teachers saying, um, what is the correlation between hand length, the length of a hand, and the length of a foot? And that's quite a nice data set to work with. And it's something that's very easily accessible because I'm hoping that most of your learners have hands and feet. Hand rulers to measure them with. Yes. Okay. Now you've got a list of good ideas next. And the first one says a real life experiment can generate can generate an amazing data set to work with. Yes, this is what we've just been talking about. Um, measurements are usually a, a very good data set to, to work with. Um, the length of hands, feet, uh, height, it's a lovely data set to work with. Um, and there are many other things that we can look at. Um, maybe there's a stop street in your area that has a lot of accidents. Yes. How about looking at um, the length of mar- uh, skid marks and how long people have braked for. Although or that maybe might be a bit of a dangerous uh, on the internet <laughs> rather bit of a dangerous experience. Yes. I wouldn't want to s- sit at a four way stop for very long. I time. think in the interest of saving time, it might be better to present them with a couple of sets of collected data already. They could then choose yes. what they're going to work with. <laughs> but maybe that's better. Maybe you choose a couple of interesting comparisons. And learners themselves can choose what interests them. And if you have a look and on draw the conclusions. Yes. Uh, and if you have a look on the blog a little bit later, I know that Helen has put up um, a website that has very amazing um, situations where which they're interesting. Yes. yes. I mean one of my favorite ones is uh, the amount of sales of ice cream um, according to different temperatures. So obviously um, well, what we'd expect is that the hotter the day is, the yes. more ice cream will be sold on that Now, day. that same website has compared the number of sales of ice cream to the number of sales of sun sunglasses. Sunglasses. Well, um, what we do need to be aware of here yes. is that um, we mustn't always assume that correlation implies causation. That is a really good topic, and um, I wish we could talk about mm. that more. But basically, in two sentences, explain what it is. Well, I think that um, when we look at temperature of a day and ice cream sales, we can say that it's causation. Obviously, the hotter so you it's are, caused it. you want to eat ice cream, so, so it's caused it. However, when we look at something like um, ice cream sales and sunglasses sales, it could be that, that a shop was very busy on one day, so there were very many ice cream sales and there were also very many sunglasses sales. It doesn't necessarily mean that if you bought an ice cream, it caused you to buy a pair of sunglasses as well. So there was a very high correlation, 
but the one is not necessarily caused by the other. Okay. That is a really interesting topic to get in depth with and if you had more than two weeks to do probability in class you probably could get into that. Maybe when you're in grade 11 you can do that more. Sure. Yes. Okay, the third point says using the tools of statistics we can analyze our own data which is fun. Yes, well I, I think that's pretty much Yes, it's a good parting remark, especially because we have just under 20 minutes left. Well, let's move on to probability. Probability. Now, probability is also taught for two weeks. Yes, it is. Okay, and we have your five-point teaching strategy in front of us. It's the first point says, revise grade 11 concepts well. Now, I know most teachers are going to say, oh, do we have to bring the dice in and roll dice all day again? No, I don't think so, because that was done in grade 9, and if you roll dice every single year, year after year, your learners are going to get very bored. It also creates the impression that probability isn't changing. You're doing the same work the whole time. Yes. And I think that's what um, many learners and teachers fall into this trap of thinking, ah, oh, probability is just about rolling dice, I don't need to do it again, and then they actually relax a little bit and um, they don't teach probability as it's meant to be taught. Yes. Mm. It's another subject where you can do a lot of real world experience, can't you? It is, yes. Um, and girls will love it because um, they need to know what outfit they can wear and so probability can tell, tell you how many different um, types of outfits you can wear, different combinations. Guys will love it because, um, you know, just tell them that they're going to buy a car and they need to choose the, the colour of the paint job and the colour of the leather seats and well, how many different combinations. It's also related to sports so yes, much. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's got to do with picking sports teams. Um, you know fixtures. we're doing lots of stereotypes here. Yeah. Yes. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another thing to possibly consider is if you're struggling to find probability examples, go and look in the maths lit textbooks yes, for math ideas. Maths literacy has a lot of wonderful probability and also statistics um, yeah. problems in it. And it's not so much technical, the questions they're asking, mm. but the context of the questions mm. it just gives you another idea and mm. way to go forward sure. to develop your own questions. Yeah. The second point says, ensure that learners know about dependent and independent events. Why do you think they struggle so much with this concept? I really don't know because um, uh, I find that learners just get confused all the time um, and it is something that should be learned from uh, early a very early stage yeah. from grade 9 but I find that learners still do struggle with it at a grade 12 level um, so if I can explain uh, quickly is I, I would use something which is completely separate so for example a dice and a coin if you throw a dice it will never influence the outcome when you toss a coin when you toss a coin it will never influence the outcome of um, you throwing a dice but even that example is flawed because actually if you're tossing a coin and you toss it again it's two independent events it is it is indeed because the first event will never influence the outcome of the second event yes however if you have something like a, a bag of marbles and you pick one marble out and you don't put it back it's going to be a dependent event because my second choice of marble will really depend on what I've chosen the first time around. Why do you think we talk about marbles? Bag. Because talking about balls is inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I think no one ever plays, the last time I played with marbles was in grade five, standard three. I was good. It really? was the only ball game I was good at. But that was the last time I ever played with marbles and it's probably the last time anyone else in grade 12 has ever played with them either. Um, you're right, but it's such a practical example and I suppose it's very easy to talk about because children really like to reminisce back to the, um, back to the good old days of grade 3. Uh, are there any other situations that you... That I you would suggest we talk this? about food. Okay, really? they have a bag of sweets and then they're ah. all wrapped in like sparkles. So you well, I would. Uh, they wrap um, the same, so that the probability of, of picking each is one same. is the same, but mm -hmm. they are different flavors. And as you know, the red ones just taste the best. So that's the one that you really yes. are aiming to get. Mm -hmm. And that way, you can have a real life example in class that they're actually going to remember, because no one's going to remember a marble example, but everyone remembers food. Sweets. You're right. And I use I use that that exact tactic when teaching. Um, little little um, 
uh, primary school learners about fractions. No one wants to uh, cut an orange in half. You want to cut a cake in half. Yes, you do. You know? So that's why we talk about food. It's a good thing you brought up fractions because, of course, probability is strongly linked to fractions it and is. decimals and mm -hmm. percentages. It is. And if they don't have it by now, well, then I don't know what they're doing in maths. Sure. I'd yeah. So yeah. It's, it's very important. And, and what we also need to remember very much is that a percentage can also be converted into a decimal. Yes. Um, and it's very difficult, and some learners still do get confused uh, about dividing or multiplying by 100. So you just need to make sure that your learners understand that a percentage and a decimal in probability are essentially the same thing. Yeah, they struggle with 70% mm -hmm. and 0, 0,7. Mm -hmm. They don't see it as the same thing, especially when you put the, the probability scale up on the board and it's 0 to 1, and then you say, place 70%. They're like, hmm? <laughs> it's over there. <laughs> Yeah, okay, number three, understand rules, and that's the product rule, the sum rule, and the complementary rule. Well, the product and the sum rule should have been done in grade 11, but it's very important because learners are always struggling between, um, uh, struggling with these, these rules. And the, the one that I find um, that's the most important at a grade 11 level is the complementary rule, and that is the probability of something not happening. Okay. So the probability of something not happening is 1 minus the probability of that same thing happening. And um, You know, it's a it's very so abstract thought when you put it like that, but mm -hmm. when you actually talk about it in a real situation, sure, it makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. So let's say there's only two options with the weather, sunny or rainy. The probability of it being rainy is 1 minus the probability of it being sunny. Does that make sense to you, Helen? It does make sense, but once again, it's very abstract because you're talking about sunny and rainy, which are not mathematical things at all. There are no numbers involved with being sunny and rainy. And now you must tell me I must subtract 1 from being sunny. Well, the probability of being sunny. Yes, the probability of being sunny. Yes. Yes. Mm. I think it works best when you, you talk about things that have a, a high number of counting, high number of possibility, or a big fraction. Not a big fraction as in size, but in parts. Sure, sure. A deck of cards is an overused example, but it really works well if you want to find mm -hmm. out the probability of not picking a three or a heart, then it's much easier to calculate it using, using the, complementary. the complementary rule. But Correct. then, of course, you're not only using the complementary rule, you're using so one of the... some rules. Yes. Correct. Yeah. And my fourth point over there uh, is working with Venn diagrams and tree diagrams. And I find that many learners are very confused with Venn diagrams. And... It is confusing. It is confusing. But, um, well, just like uh, many things in, in mathematics, it's it's like Shrek, it's like an onion, it has layers. Yes. And you get given all these pieces of information and you always start with the one piece of information that you know is absolutely true and correct and can only fit into one um, segment or portion of your, of your Venn diagram. And then you can work very slowly and systematically to fill in your whole Venn diagram. And it's often... Um, it's often like a bit of a puzzle, yes. but if you if you do it systematically, it's uh, it'll always work out. I wonder how many Venn diagrams they'll actually be asked to draw up Venn diagrams rather than interpret them. Generally, there's only one question per metric paper, but sometimes you don't even have to um, fill in the numbers on Venn diagrams. You just have to interpret them. But it's still a, it's a good. Uh, it's a good concept to know. The other concept that you should know is tree diagrams. And I, I quickly want to just draw a, a tree diagram over here. Let's say I have um, two uh, two branches on each. Yes. Sorry about that. Um, and let's say I've got um, ten sparkles in a bag. And I've got three red ones and seven blue ones. The probability of me picking a red one will be 3 out of 10. Am I yes. right? Yes. And the probability of me picking a blue one will be 7 out of 10. Yes. What many learners don't, under, um, don't uh, take into account when drawing tree diagrams is that um, because this is a dependent event, you have to take um, one away from the 
denominator each time because you're now only choosing from nine sparkles on and your next And this is event. why I like the eating thing because you say you take one out and you eat it. And you then it's it gone. Back. Yeah. So Because who puts a sparkle back in the bag? Nobody. Mm. So on this um, branch or on this set of branches, we will always have a fraction out of nine. If we choose if we want to choose red again, we need to be aware that we ate that red one, so there are now two to choose from. However, if we're going to eat a blue one, there's still seven blues in the bag because we chose a red one. Yes. If we're choosing a red one, because we chose a blue one first, there will still be three blues left in the bag. However, if we ate a blue one and we want to choose another blue one, there will only be six left in the bag. And learners find this very difficult to understand. And and I, th so I think that... Um, Working with tree diagrams is, is very important to understand, especially when we talk about dependent events. You know what I've found in my past is that they struggle with the starting point. Why is nothing written over there? Why do we only start over here? <laughs> and what do you say to them, Helen? I tell them about parallel universes. I've <laughs> got to be honest, I'm a bit of a sci-fi junkie. And so I start talking about, you know, there's... When every time you make a choice, there are two different things that happen. There's a yes option and that person goes off and they're happy and there's a no option where the person is sad. And Yeah. So you're saying this is the root of all, uh, That's root all, of all decisions. It's almost a timeline. It's you start here and you make your choice. It's the and red pill red or, the or the blue pill. Yes. <laughs> and then you're over here. Now you make another choice red pill or the blue, blue pill so deal with each arm individually as sure. they branch as off happens. more and more but of course if you're dealing with huge um, tree diagrams or huge amounts of data it's impractical to do it that way yes and then you need to start looking at other methods counting methods yes yes okay. so my fifth point is working on um, counting techniques and that is um, if there are M choices of something and M choices of another thing, um, the amount of choices altogether is N times N. And I think we have an example a little bit later on of that. Yes, now we are going to look at your three pressure points quickly. Um, I think we need to hurry up. Yes, we do. Uh, the knowledge for creating and using Venn diagrams teach and tree diagrams. Well, I think we spoke about that um, just previously now, especially with tree diagrams. We really need to be spot on when um, looking at the fractions with tree diagrams that we take into account um, independent and dependent variables. Yes. And using Venn diagrams, well, I think the key is just to be slow and systematic, fill in what you have, and then from that work, work um, towards finding what you don't have. I wonder how many you should really do in class. In terms of examples? Yes. How much time should you really spend on filling in a Venn diagram? I'm not sure if you should spend that much time filling in one, rather spend more time interpreting. Because that's where your questions... Correct. More Although than I think it's good to... It's, it'll be good to do both. Okay. Mm. Uh, understanding the counting techniques, which we'll go over just now. We will indeed. And the last point says confusing dependent and independent events, and we have we spoken, have spoken about, about that. that. Mm. Okay, I'm going to rush straight to the counting um, problem. And it says, assuming all of your clothes match and you have twice as many shirts as pants, how many items of clothing do you need to have a unique outfit every day for 32 days? Well, in the definition over there, it says when there are m ways to do one thing and n ways to do another, there are m times n ways to do both. So I'm going to say, um, let my number of pants be x, and it says I've got twice as many shirts of um, shirts than pants. So therefore, my shirts will should be two x. So now, um, we, as we see my definition, um, if I wanted to find out how many combinations of shirts and pants I have, I'm going to say 2x multiplied by x, and I want my answer to be 32, 32 right? Because I want days. 32 outfits. Yes. So 2x times x is 2x squared, and I divide through by 2 to get x on, squared on its own, and I get that x squared is equal to 16, and therefore x is equal to 4. So let's just interpret this answer. I need to have four pairs of trousers and um, therefore I will have eight 
shirts. So that's and if I take it and have a look here, four times eight is thirty-two. I will therefore be able to make 32 different combinations of outfits and if I'm a total girl and I never want to wear the same outfit for a whole month, this will suit me very perfectly, just to have four pants and eight shirts. So that's 12 items of clothing all together. Mm -hmm. What a bargain. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes it is, uh, assuming they all do match. Now this, this is the type of question that requires thinking beyond the definition, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. And this is also a wonderful um, question that uh, integrates different areas of um, mathematics in that we needed to use um, algebra equations over here to solve our answer, which is essentially a probability question. Okay. Okay, well, Robin, I think we have come to the end, unfortunately, because we did want to talk about a little bit more, but I will put it in the blog, and I'll put all of those websites in, th in the blog. Robin, can you press sure. escape for me? Remember that if you want to see more content, if you want to brush up on your content, go to the Mindset website, click on Mathematics, and it will take you to this page over here. Go down to grade 12. Isn't it nice how it's arranged into it's terms? It's arranged so wonderfully, and if you scroll all the way down, it goes to Statistics and, and then counting, counting and probability. probability. You click on either one of those, and you will see all of our resources all collected onto one page for those two sections. So it's it's great. It's very easy to find what you're looking for if you need to brush up on your content. What a wonderful resource for our teachers. Yes, and speaking of resources, if we have not spoken about a brilliant idea that you have that you want to share with us, please remember to send it through at competitions at digitalclassroom.co.za include the secret code in the subject line and then we'll make those resources public. And don't forget you stand to win a phone or a tablet. Wow. Yes, good times. Thank you for joining us. Next week we'll be talking about grade 10 statistics and Hamlin will be joining us so I'm looking forward to that and then you're back the week after aren't you? Look forward to seeing you again. Yes, thank you Karen for your magic behind the scenes and we'll be seeing you next week. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.